Good morning and welcome to Atwood Presbyterian on May 23rd, uh, the long weekend. And, uh, you know, we just live for the long weekend here in Canada, don't we? And, uh, you know, over life I've noticed that the long weekend is almost always wet <laughs> and rainy. And, uh, well, so far we're okay, but it looks like Monday might be a little rainy. But um, anyways, you know, we do have some orders from the government to... Uh, stay home and avoid going to you know gatherings and uh you know we as christians have to set an example for every other people in the world and uh you know i'm going to be staying at home i don't like it i'd rather be out and about but um pandemic is going to be over soon so let's uh, have that hope on the horizon and you know speaking of hope that's my hope that this Sunday that uh, our worship service here uh, at Atwood Presbyterian that you find a message of hope a message of inspiration uh, you know listen to the word of God maybe there is something there for you this week uh, to nurture your faith and uh, uh, strengthen your relationship with God you know, and I always just dive in here, and I was just thinking, there's probably a few people online that, uh, okay, who is this guy? Um, anyways, I am the Reverend Ernie Naylor. I've been the minister at Atwood Presbyterian for about five years, and uh, it's a wonderful place. It's I would describe it as a family church. Uh, if you come and join us on a Sunday, you'll see multiple generations of families worshiping together, and uh, yeah, it's it's a very... I, I'm a very blessed minister to be here. Um, they uh, take their faith seriously, and uh, you know, and they give back to the community. And I just want to say a word of thanks. There's been some workers in the church kind of silently going around the background doing a few things. Uh, we had a couple, and they came in and they trimmed the hedges and the shrubs. Uh, we had someone else in and, and regraded our driveway and uh, cleaned that up. And, uh, of course, we had another person in who was mow busy mowing the lawn. And he says the grass is like a hay field. It's really growing well this spring. So uh, we had seniors dining this past week, and uh, I know everybody asked, well, how many people did you serve? Uh, so we had 50 people in a drive through and we followed all the health unit regulations. Um, we do this in conjunction with Noel Crest Lodge. Noel Crest sends over a person, um, disinfects the church, makes sure there's, you know, I think the rules are four or five people in the kitchen. And uh, it was a huge success. and. Uh, yeah, so just a note on that. Um, we do have a plan to start our drive-in services. We're looking at June 13th. I think that's, hope that's the right date. And it was the second week in June. And uh, the lockdown was supposed to end right around that time and then reopen gradually. Um, not 100% sure what that means, but looking at the rules and regulations, um, drive-in services are okay. Uh, so we'll try and do the same as what we did last year. We'll have a guest musician come in. I've been a, a few feelers out. Uh, if you know anyone that is an exceptional musician, well, it doesn't have to be exceptional, but uh, uh, someone who just loves to sing or play a musical instrument, wants to perform for us, uh, let me know and I'll inquire. Um, I think we have maybe one or two slots, maybe three slots that are kind of unfilled. I have uh, quite a few people yeah, I think I can do it, but I got to make sure, you, you know, those kind of things, you know, people are busy. And so uh, anyway, stay tuned for that. It will be earlier. It will be at a 10 o'clock. Uh, it'll be a little shorter because we can't open up the washrooms in theory. Um, of course, you can use the washroom if you're desperate, but um, but shortening the service up will allow people to get out. Uh, if it's warm out, you know, you won't get overheated in the car. And uh, yeah, that's kind of our plan, the same as last year. Um, stay tuned. Well, let's turn to our worship service this morning. And uh, I'm going to talk about grief in the sermon. Uh, you know, Jesus cried. So that's kind of a bit of a focus this, um, this Sunday. And... Uh, but anyways, let's start with our, our call to worship. Breathe upon us, Holy Spirit, and inspire our worship with your truth. Stir our hearts, Holy Spirit, and fill us with your love. Strengthen us, Holy Spirit, and move us to act with your power. Breathe in us, Holy Spirit, and receive our prayers and praise. Please join me in prayer. God of power and possibility, 
With the flame of your spirit, you give us energy to move into the world in Jesus' name. With the breath of your spirit, you refresh us to engage life in its complexity. Your spirit embraces us in our diversity, invites us to find unity in your love, and honor you for the gift of creation, all its beauty and bounty. We praise you for your presence with us in every time and place. In this time of worship, send us the Holy Spirit once again, and renew us to serve you in the world, the world that aches for the healing and the wholeness you offer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So this morning I've got um, one rather lengthy piece of scripture. Um, And you know, as I I read the scripture, there's there's a very powerful scripture lesson. Um, And there's a lot more in the scripture lesson than what I really read or thought about when I first read it. You know, this is, we're talking about the death of Lazarus. Um, who was Jesus' friend, uh, and uh, you remember Mary and Martha, another couple of Jesus' friends. Um, this was their brother. And so anyways, last week we talked about how Jesus um, prays for us and how Jesus cares for us. And when we first read this on the surface, the scripture lesson seems like Mary and Martha are, are calling for Jesus. Um, in our today's world, we say praying for Jesus. And it seems like Jesus is ignoring them, uh, you know, just carrying on with his own life. But Jesus does have a plan. God has a plan that, you know, we're not really privy to. And so when we read this, Lazarus is, uh, Jesus has been informed that Lazarus is gravely ill. And Jesus, as I said, just carries on with his work, takes his time to get back. And when he does get back, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Now, this is a a very significant point because in the Bible, the Jewish belief system was that if a person um, was dead for three days, they believed that the spirit kind of hovered over top and that the spirit could return during those three days. But once that three days was up, that person was truly dead. There was no hope. Um, Yeah, so we're talking at a point where the situation is hopeless. So that is what the author of John is trying to tell us at this point in time. You know, Lazarus is dead. It is hopeless. But the next, there's a few lines in here that hope that only God can give. And I think the word I'm going to say, but I know he will again rise on the resurrection of the last day. And so with these words... Um, I feel like this um, intro is getting kind of long, but it is kind of important to understand it. Um, This is another important part. Resurrection in the Jewish understanding was you died and you maybe wait there in death for 100, 200, 300, 400 years until the resurrection day, and then you'll be raised from the dead and join um, Jesus and God in um, heaven. Jesus is pointing to a different truth that we go to heaven immediately. So, anyways, let's turn to our scripture. Enough of the intro. And so we're reading from John 11. And uh, it's going to be a lengthy chunk, 1 to 44. And uh, I'm reading from the NIV version. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you there. And yet you want to go back there? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by the world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. 
After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. And Jesus had been speaking of his own death. But his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. Let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, and we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my mother, brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Then Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she said. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When Jesus, who had been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed that, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not he have opened the eyes of the blind man, have kept this man from dying? Jesus once again, more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus says, I, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen, a cloth around his face, and Jesus said to him, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Amen. All glory to God, the reading of his holy word. Well, as I started earlier, the last week's sermon, we talked about Jesus and how he prayed for us. And you know, we made the point, prayer is love. And we explored the tough problem of, does God always get what God wants? On the surface, it appears, no. But in this scripture lesson... It's very clearly, yes. You know, we talked about a few things about God as revealed in the scripture last week, that God has imposed limits on himself, and that in our free will he cannot force himself on us. But there are times that he does change the rules. And, we have, and the other part that we explore is that we have to freely accept God's grace and love. Hindsight's always wonderful. And as I thought about the sermon afterwards, it seemed to me that what I was really doing was addressing 
grief. You know, there's been a lot of talk about grief in society now. Um, churches are preparing to reopen, and ministers have this concern that we're going to have to deal with a lot of grief from the pandemic. The grief that has built up over the pandemic. The mental health article I read this week said, those who experienced the loss of a loved one during the pandemic may find their grief coming to the surface as life returns to normal. And the article continues, according to recent research, people experienced higher levels of grief when they bereaved due to COVID-19 compared to other causes of death. The study was conducted because researchers predict the circumstances before and after COVID-19, and we're talking intensive care admission, unexpected death, secondary stressors, social isolation, will cause an increase of prolonged grief disorder and persistent complex bereavement disorder across the world. Well, there's some big words in there, and I'm not really sure what complex bereavement disorder is. Some big words, but simply means that we will be grieving as a people after the pandemic is over. Our life has been placed on hold and many are wondering where is God in the midst of this mess? A lot of people are feeling that we are not getting through to God in our prayers. And yeah, he's kind of places on hold. Kind of like our scripture lesson this morning. He's, he's out there, but he's not here. This past week I was driving home from church and I listened to a radio talk host and she was lamenting, trying to get through to her bank. You know, and she was a little bitter and she related how she was at work and needed to talk about her bank account. She said it was something so simple, it, like, it just needed a couple minutes just to, to make sure it was right and she had been placed on hold for over an hour. And you know the recording, don't you? You are important to us. Please hold. We value your business. Please hold. And then it repeats. And then she shared a frustration that this is the same thing that happens every time she's tried to contact her bank in the last five years. And she questioned, when does a business wake up and admit that there is a problem and we should hire more staff? She speculated it cannot be a monetary issue the banks are making huge profits. As I was driving down the road, I was nodding my head in agreement. Yeah, you got that right. As I had my own experience with a bank call center, they really don't seem to care about me or my business. And then my mind wandered to today's scripture lesson. The truth is that there are times when we feel God is absent. Grief is one of those times, but the reality is that Jesus is with us in our time of need. Jesus values us and guides and nurtures us on our life journey. And there is something particularly important in the scripture lesson. A proof, if you like, of Jesus' love for us. Scripture tells us that Mary was weeping over Lazarus' death and that her friends who were with her, who gathered to support her and Mary and Martha in their grief, were weeping also. And that Jesus, when he encountered them, moved in spirit and troubled. I like that word, troubled. Isn't that a caring word? It's, it then says that Jesus wept before he raised Lazarus from the dead. And he wept. I'm going to repeat that again. And he wept. It's the shortest verse in the entire Bible. He wept. At first glance, it seems like he is weeping because Mary is weeping. He's, he's sharing her grief. And Mary is weeping for the very reason we weep when we experience grief. Her loss has inflicted a wound that is deep, and the numbness and the pain are being expressed through those tears. Everyone experiences loss throughout life. That's just human reality. The death of a loved one is unmatched for the emptiness and the sadness that we feel. Our lives are placed on hold for a while. 
The world continues at the same place, ticking along, yet our own internal clock is slowed down as a new life appears out of our grief and sadness as we reprocess this new reality. Each of us process grief in a different way. And for Mary, it is crying. And tears are a wonderful God-given mechanism for healing. When we cry, did you ever notice that we have two overwhelming thoughts when those tears flow? The first is that overwhelming sense of sadness. It's just overwhelming. You just simply can't process it. But the interesting thing is the second feeling is that we need to stop and get over this. We need to stop crying. Well, we have to admit that society forms and informs our outlook in the world. And society has this view that tears are a sign of weakness. You gotta have that stoic face in a time of grief that shows strength. You know, that's one truth that we really present to our men. Stoic. Be strong. Tough it up, buttercup. But that is wrong. The grief expert, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, I, I love her writing, her theories. But she has this to say about tears. Tears are a symbol of life a part of who we are and what we feel. They live in us and through us. They represent us and they reside in our pain. And this symbol and representation of pain can appear any time since it's tied to life itself. I found that line, it is tied to life itself, very intriguing. Tears are tied to life itself. In grief support groups, there is a, a rule that everyone has to grab their own tissue to dry their tears. The reason is, is that when someone starts to cry, everyone grabs a box of tissue, shoves it under their nose, into that grieving person's face, and the message they're giving is, yeah, I'm trying to be helpful, but the action sends the message, I've had enough of your tears, please stop. I thought about that. What do you think? I think there's some truth in there. Paraphrasing Kubler-Ross, we should cry and continue to cry until the tears are gone because this is a wonderful gift of healing that God has given us. Remember those words I just spoke? Tears are tied to life itself. What is life itself? Yes, Jesus. Interesting. I'm going off on a bit of a tangent. And this will make sense in a short while. <laughs> when Jesus tells Lazarus to come out of the tomb, and this is another little, um, little point in the scripture lesson that you kind of gloss over if you don't stop and, and research it and think about it. I want you to think about this. The Greek word that Jesus shouts for Lazarus to rise is, only occurs eight times in the Greek Bible. And John uses it six times. So it's a very specific word. It has two meanings. In chapter 18 and 19, it's used four times for the shouts of the crowd to crucify Jesus. And the other two times is used by Jesus to conquer death. Isn't that interesting? The crowd shouts, our human shouts bring death to Jesus. But Jesus shouting brings life. In this case, Jesus shouting brings life to Lazarus. And the lesson we learn to us as well, Jesus brings life. And tears are tied to life itself. So we have Mary standing before Jesus who has control over life. 
She is standing in tears, a wonderful gift of healing that God has given us, and she is blaming Jesus for the death of her brother. Human reaction. When we grieve, is to find and play the fault game. The blame game. However you want to say it. The fault game, the blame game. We ask ourselves, how did this go so wrong? It has to be someone's fault. Mary clearly felt that way. If you had been here, Jesus, my brother would be alive. It's your fault. Jesus, it's your fault. Many people are doing the same thing in this pandemic. This disruption, this grief, it has to be someone's fault. We blame the politicians. We blame the air tra- or the airplane travelers. We blame the medical profession for getting it wrong. We blame our neighbor for sitting in his backyard with a few family friends. We play the blame game. And the game distracts us from the loss that we feel. And it's something that we really need to examine and to come to terms with if we are to find peace and return to peace, return to normality. So we can see the grief of Mary and Martha and her friends. But this is where this is all leading up to. What about Jesus' grief? The words, Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. The words of scripture say Jesus was troubled at witnessing Mary and Martha's tears. And we need to explore that. And why is that? Is Jesus feeling Mary and Martha's pain? Is he blaming himself for not arriving earlier? Is it something else? We will never know for sure how or why Jesus felt this way. But I want to give you something to think about. Maybe Jesus' tears go far deeper than these points. Maybe the tears are pointing to a larger truth. If we read on in scripture, we discover that Lazarus being raised from the dead has upset the authorities. And they want Lazarus dead. In their minds, if Lazarus is dead, then there's no proof that Jesus has control over life and death. Therefore, he's a fraud kind of convoluted thinking. And so this is what happens next. Although it's not included in the text we read, it's essential to understand this passage. Although some of the bystanders believe, others go and report Jesus to the authorities that it's on this basis that they decide definitively to put Jesus to death and to put a bounty on Lazarus' head. The immediate way to the cross and Jesus' own tomb starts here where Jesus is most impossibly, lovingly giving life. And they will plan to kill Lazarus too. Once the word about him gets out, Jesus' actions have placed a death sentence on Lazarus. Maybe Jesus' tears. Important thing to think about. Maybe Jesus' tears are in response to knowing that his life-giving actions over death will place his friend and his family in harm's way. That Lazarus will not have an easy life from here on. He will be continually looking over his shoulder. His family will be continually looking over their shoulders for the rest of their life in fear. Is there someone after us? When are the authorities going to come for us? I know they want me dead. But also Jesus, raising of Lazarus from the dead, will speed up his own death, which will lead to the resurrection, in which we encounter the grace of God, and to which we freely participate. Maybe Lazarus is us. Just let's just do some metaphorical thinking. You know, we are being pulled in the grave of death by a pandemic, the overwhelming I was going to use the word nastiness in the world. 
that world has been maybe blinded to the truth that the one who gives life is there beside us, busy at work. Mary and Martha sent word for Jesus and probably felt that Jesus was ignoring them, yet he was completing his kingdom work in his time and in his way. The truth is, we are bound by death in our current lives. But we are called to life by Jesus, who is the light and life of the world. It's right there in scripture. Jesus stands at the edge of our metaphorical tomb of death, shedding words of life to us. Come out. Don't hunker down your buildings. Come out. We can substitute our own name for that of Lazarus. Hear Jesus' command and walk into the light of day. And you all just pulling those grave claws, those death claws away as we go into full life with God. Amen. When we turn to our pastoral prayer, we, we've had a few um, deaths in the community, some um, close friends to the church, others are close friends to the community. And, you know, continue to keep those families in your thoughts and prayers. Um, really don't like spelling out people's names, but the, the Duncan family is, uh, uh, a, we feel a great um, kinship with them. I guess I'll use that word. And uh, so anyways, I was down visiting and Things are going pretty good considering everything. And, uh, and Kathy um, tried to express her thanks uh, for all we've done to support them in their, um, in their time of grief and this unexpected death. But as we explore in our scripture that uh, it is not a death, it's just a transition to heaven and that we will see our loved one again. And uh, so anyways, um, let's uh, lift our hearts in prayer. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us in your whole church on this day of Pentecost. Blow through us and renew our faith. Reawaken our love for God. Let our flames warm our hearts with trust in Jesus Christ and dare us to do great things in his name. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us and renew our faith. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us and give us energy to serve you as the body of Christ working in the world. Open our eyes to recognize needs for ministry and mission around us. Open our hearts to welcome newcomers and meet those who do not know you yet. Open our hearts to share in tasks that need being done. Open our lips to prayer and praise. Wind of the Spirit blow through us and renew our energy to serve. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us and give us understanding for all those whose lives seem so different from ours. For those facing situations we've never encountered. For those whom we disagree. For problems and challenges at home, at work, and in the world. People are still struggling with the effects of the pandemic. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us and give us new understanding. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us and bring healing for all who face pain or illness, discouragement, disappointment, grief. For those who face stress and pressure, especially as they recover from the pandemic. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us and bring us the compassion we see in Jesus Christ. Blow through us and equip us to serve the world you love in his name. Blow through us and refresh us as your faithful followers. Unite us across our differences as together we pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil for thy is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So I was uh, saying that prayer, I realized I goofed up a little bit that this is Pentecost Sunday and I, but I was listening to the Spirit and it really felt like I had to preach the sermon that I had there. I can't explain it. It's just one of those things, those holy God mystery. So anyways, it is Pentecost Sunday, you know, the Sunday when the Holy Spirit enters the church. It's kind of the birthday party of the church in a way. And uh, it's a special Sunday. And hopefully we will be able to gather together shortly. It could be a few months. It'll happen. But anyways, go into the world with God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and give you peace from this day forward and forevermore. Amen.